Intelligent Speech is happening online on Saturday, June 25th, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Time, and consists of four simultaneous rooms presenting engaging talks, roundtable discussions, and rousing Q&As. Trevor Cully from the History of Persia podcast. Tegan Phillips of the History and Philosophy of Physics podcast. And Gary Stevens from the History and the Bible podcast. Sarah of the Rejects and Revolutionaries podcast. Me and Christy, the host of Terranauts. Jamie Jeffers from the British History podcast. Tickets are available at intelligentspeechconference.com and your ticket entitles you to both live attendance and access to all recordings after the fact if you cannot be there at the time or want to catch more of the amazing content happening simultaneously. Ancient Persian propaganda in modern Iran. Napoleonic themed round table. Solar spectroscopy. The Mystocles and the space program and the collective power of the big idea. Tickets again are available at intelligentspeechconference.com and we hope to see you there. Hello everyone, Casting Through Ancient Greece will be speaking at the Intelligent Speech Conference this year on the 25th of June. I'll be presenting my talk around the theme of crossings in my presentation titled An Age of Change, the Greco-Persian War. For more details and to purchase tickets, head to www.intelligentspeechconference.com. If you use the code CASTING, you'll also receive a discount on your tickets. Anyway, I look forward to seeing those of you who can make it, but now let's get on with today's episode. Kaiman, like a skilled athlete at the games, having in one day carried off two victories, wherein he surpassed that of Salamis by sea and that of Plataea by land, was encouraged to try for yet another success. Plutarch. Hello, I'm Mark Selleck and welcome back to Casting Through Ancient Greece, episode 54, Clash at the Eurymedon. This episode we are going to continue our focus on the operations of the Delian League in the Aegean, before we then turn to the political developments back in Greece next episode. So far, we have followed the inception of the Delian League, where it would be born out of the departing interests of both Athens and Sparta within the Hellenic League. The newest members of the League in 478 BC, the many Eastern Greeks, had become dissatisfied with Spartan leadership and saw their interests in Anatolia and the Aegean not aligned with that of Sparta and the other Peloponnesians. This we are then told, according to Thucydides, saw them approach Athens, with similar interests as them, to take on the role of commanding the League. What then developed was not a change in the leadership within the Hellenic League, but a new league would be formed. They could see that the shared interests of all the members would be the primary focus. This league would be what we call today the Delian League. The island of Delos being the site of the first congress and the location of the league's treasury. We then saw with the league now created and its objectives outlined, preserving Greek freedoms and preventing further Persian aggression in the Aegean, it would begin campaigning in and around the Aegean. The objective of the league would see that its strength lay in its navy, with the members contributing ships, men or money on an ongoing basis. Last episode we followed the summary of events given by Thucydides over the League's opening campaigns during the 470s. This as we saw proved to highlight the development of the League in its early years, as well as Thucydides explaining the growth of Athenian power. We saw how Persian controlled areas were first targeted by the Delian League before then Greek islands and cities would be in their sights. Initially we saw this through pragmatic responses to piracy on Skyros, but then coercion would enter into the actions carried out. This would be highlighted at the attack on Charistus, in a strategically important position from Athens' point of view, and benefiting from the League's presence, though they themselves were not members and didn't contribute to the protection the fleet provided. We then saw how this summary was rounded out, with the League having to force one of its own back into the League. The island of Naxos would try to leave, having been one of the original members. This action would be seen as unacceptable in the eyes of Athens and apparently the rest of the League who viewed this as a revolt. Perhaps the perceived absence of any strong Persian presence in the Aegean for a number of years has started to see members question the cost of maintaining their membership. Though as we will see this episode, the Persian threat had not yet disappeared and the Delian League would engage the largest Persian force since the Persian invasion of 480 BC. In this episode we are going to focus on events where we left them last episode. This will see us focusing on the Battle of the Eurymedon River a major battle that would develop between the navy of the Delian League and the Persian forces. This would be the first time since Eon that we would hear of the Greeks engaging the Persians and what would appear to be another active Persian attempt against the Greeks. Though before we look at the events leading to this battle, we will first look at what had been taking place in the Persian Empire 
since the defeat along the Anatolian coast in Hellespont. As we have seen with Persian events, it can be difficult to get a clear picture of what was taking place, and this period would be no exception, if not more difficult. After the Greek victories in the Aegean in 479, it becomes impossible to string together any sort of clear narrative of what was taking place in Persia. We do get an idea of some things that were taking place, but in no real cohesive history of the period after Mikale. The activities that seem to rest on more stable ground during this period tend to be around the building activities that were taking place within the empire, but we will visit this in a little bit. First we will look at what appears to be been taking place after the Persian retreat, and then we will delve into the years following, where a thick haze sets in. So as you may remember, after the Greek victory at Plataea, the Persian commander Artabazos retreated out of Greece and back through Thracian lands, as he made his way to the Hellespont. We are told that his forces suffered badly during this retreat, though there is reason to believe that Persia was still able to maintain some sort of control in Thracian lands, directly after the retreat. For starters, we know that the coastal city of Eon was in Persian hands up to two years after the Persian retreat, as this was one of the first targets of the Delian League. Even though the Persians suffered a disastrous defeat, it does appear they were able to maintain some sort of control along the Thracian coast, perhaps due to their ability to continue to supply these areas, as the Greeks were not yet active in the area. Another possibility that could explain why these areas were not overrun might be down to the previously subjected Thracians, not sure where they stood with the Persians, or more importantly, whether they were weak enough to challenge yet. Herodotus in his account tells us that Artabazos during his retreat had reported that Mardonius and his forces were not far behind him, to give the impression that there were still more forces than just his in the region. This may have gone some way into the Thracians and other regions not acting decisively against the Persians and allowed time for the Persian garrisons to establish themselves. Though this was directly after the Persian retreat and their influence in the region would not last long. With the creation of the Delian League, most of the coastlines around the Aegean would be rid of Persian influence. We saw Eon was the first target of the League, but it appears Persian influence in the area may have been initially put under strain with the Hellenic League's capture of both the shores of the Hellespont in 479, and then its subsequent campaign against Byzantium in the next year. This would have most likely served as the most direct supply route back to Persian lands, relying on a connection just by sea would have been perilous at best with the Greeks controlling the Aegean. I also want to mention here that with these activities taking place in Thrace, that saw much destabilisation, Macedon would take advantage of the power vacuum, moving into previously held Thracian lands, while a Thracian tribe towards the east would also take advantage and created what would be known as the Idrissian Kingdom. Though we will look in more detail at these developments later in the series. So during these early years after the Greek victories, Persian control all along the Thracian coast and through to Byzantium had been reduced. The episode around Pausanias and Byzantium that we looked at a couple of episodes ago and his overtures to Xerxes could have been a possible attempt for the Persians to re-exert control back into this important city though it is hard to know what to exactly make of these actions around Pausanias. As for the Anatolian coast, this was the site of the Persian defeat of Mycale in 479 BC, and would spark what Herodotus would call a second Ionian revolt. Though how much of the coast was freed from the Persian yoke is hard to tell, it appears the regions directly around the Greek victory were somewhat liberated, though maintaining support all along the coastline would have been extremely difficult for the Greeks, with these areas all connected to the Persian Empire. We don't hear much about Artaphernes after Mycale, who was a satrap controlling the region, but it seems likely he was directing operations against the western parts that were revolting. Though these early years after the Persian defeats probably saw his ability to launch military campaigns limited. Not to mention, with the destruction of the Persian fleet and the Greek dominance off the coast making campaigning against coastal cities much more difficult. Anyway, we'll be revisiting the Persians on the Anatolian coast in the second part of this episode as the next major battle between the Persians and the Greeks would develop. This for now I think gives us some idea of Persian involvement on the fringes of the empire towards Greek interests. But now let's turn to some activities that seem to have been taking place within the empire away from Greek eyes, though these are far from certain and still much debate surrounds them and how they should be interpreted. Though I feel with this disclaimer in mind, they still give some food for thought. Also, I want to point out here that I became aware of these possible events through my talks with Trevor Cully from the History of Persia podcast, when a year ago I had him on the show. After our talk, I asked for some more information on these points, and he was kind enough to send me some resources, though he did give the warning that these points were still heavily debated today, and to keep in mind when exploring them. Anyway, I hope that makes it clear that we shouldn't accept what I'm about to talk about just based off what I present. 
However, it is interesting and I think well worth looking at as it gives some possible snapshots of what may have been taking place in the Persian Empire after Xerxes returned home from Greece. These events would indicate that further campaigning in other parts of the empire were taking place while there may have also been revolts in the east of the empire that had to be dealt with. The first rests with an inscription known as the Davia inscription, while the latter can be found in the closing pages of Herodotus' histories, though with colourful elements not foreign to Herodotus. Let's first look at these possible campaigns. So the reason it is thought that there were other campaigns taking place after 479 BC comes down to two names found on the Davia inscription. This inscription on the stone tablets that was uncovered at the palace complex of Persepolis is the only known list of subjected regions under Xerxes' rule. At the heart of this text is the description of Xerxes destroying cult centres in conquered territories, where what is described as the Davia being worshipped, this roughly meaning false gods. Though what is interesting in this text is the appearance of two groups of people that have never been referred to in previous Persian inscriptions when listing controlled lands. The inscription is often seen as dating to somewhere between Xerxes' invasion of Greece and before the Battle of the Eurymedon, based off of other regions he lists. In a period of Persian history where we are left in the dark a lot, this has been seen to provide possibly a slight insight into what might have been taking place. This has then seen the possibility that Xerxes, when back in Persia after his return from Salamis, may have been involved in campaigns elsewhere in the empire, which may have seen this period mark the furthest extent the Persian Empire would spread. Again, this is a very thin thread to base any certainty on, but based off of what we do know about Persian expansionism, its activities in the West allowed us in the historical records thanks to the Greeks, but thanks to archaeology we get a picture that by far its greatest gains and frequency of campaigns were elsewhere in the surrounding regions of the Empire. So it makes this scenario seem like a very plausible possibility. During this period we also get the possibility that Xerxes was having to deal with a revolt in an important region of his empire in the east. Further to this, it would not be seen to be led by any old governor, but one of his brothers. Herodotus gives us a colourful picture of court intrigue that would supposedly lead to the attempted revolt in Bactria. This story was based on Xerxes falling in love with his brother, Mecistius' wife, though his advances were ignored and he sought to become closer to her by marrying his son to her daughter. Apparently then Xerxes instead fell for the daughter and engaged in an affair. He offered her anything that she desired and she would request the royal robe he wore, which was made by his wife, Queen Amistris. Their affair would be discovered through her wearing of the robe. We are then told Amistris would seek revenge, not against Xerxes' mistress, but her mother and the wife of Mecistius. She would be tortured and brutalised and once Mecistius found out, he would make his way back to Bactria to stir up revolt and harm Xerxes' rule. Now we do know Herodotus enjoys relating these colourful tales and the Greeks are fans of hearing about court intrigues taking place in other lands, but this story could still hold some details of the reality of the situation back in Persia after the defeat in 479. We know that Mecistius had been one of the leading generals for Xerxes' invasion, with him commanding forces along with Mardonius that followed the coastline through Thrace. We know he commanded elements of the infantry, but we are not aware of the actions he would take place in until 479 at the Battle of Mycale. Though he would be witness to the campaign in Greece and the fighting back in Persian territory. This would have seen him witness a number of disastrous defeats. It is then perhaps this fact that most modern scholars tend to think being a catalyst behind the revolt being stirred up in the empire, rather than the juicy stories of court intrigue that the Greeks love to hear about. Xerxes' failure at subjugating Greece may have undermined his authority with some of those in his inner circle. This is a point we will explore some more in the future when we look at the death of Xerxes and coming to power of the next Persian king. For now, these bits of information give us a glimpse into possible events and activities that were taking place in Persia after the defeat of the second invasion. But let's now turn to some activities that were taking place that are a little bit more certain. It's also important to note that this period after the second Persian invasion was not just filled with military matters. We also get evidence that Xerxes had been very active in seeing grand building projects take place at various Persian capitals. Now it is hard to pin down exactly when these building projects were taking place precisely, though with Xerxes coming to power in 486 and his campaign wrapping up in 479, it is fairly safe to assume these projects would have been continuing or started to take place after this period. Many of the construction efforts were at sites that his father, Darius, had begun in his own reign. At Susa, a couple of inscriptions point to Xerxes building projects there. These include a palace being built on the Acropolis 
as well as him having what is known as the Darius Gate completed. These two projects are ones that we can point to him being involved in, though there is the possibility there might be more as further excavations take place and more inscriptions are discovered. At Persepolis, Xerxes would also add to his father's projects, with the constructions being in the same style but on a grander level. He would be responsible for the Gate of All Nations, which consisted of a grand hall, the Gate's name being in reference to the subjected peoples of the Empire. He also completed the construction of the Apardana Palace, which had been his father's palace and where he would use it for official audiences. Next to this palace, Xerxes would then construct his own, again being on a grander scale. This was known as the Throne Hall, and also known as the Hundred Columns Palace. This structure was primarily used by Xerxes to meet military commanders and their representatives of subjected peoples. Though this palace would not be fully completed by the time of Xerxes' death, and it would be his son who would have it completed. There were also other palaces that Xerxes would have completed, at Persepolis and the Imperial Treasury, though it is thought that these have been completed around the same time as the campaigns in Greece. Anyway, here we can see that Xerxes had been involved in other activities than just military campaigns and putting down revolts. Perhaps these construction initiatives that were taking and probably continuing to take place over his entire reign are a good sign that his empire and his rule were not in any sort of trouble after the campaign against Greece, and some have sought to put forward. But let's now get back to events where the Delian League would find itself responding to what appears to be another attempt by Xerxes to direct forces against the Greeks. Anger, sing goddess, the anger of Achilles, son of Peleus, that accursed anger, which brought the Greeks endless sufferings and sent the mighty souls of many warriors to Hades, leaving their bodies as carrion for the dogs and a feast for the birds, and Zeus's purpose was fulfilled. It all began when Agamemnon, lord of men and godlike Achilles, quarrelled and parted. These are the opening lines of one of the oldest surviving poems in the world, the Iliad. Over on Patreon, we are currently doing a three-part look at Homer and his works. So far, we have looked at the man himself and what Homeric poetry is. Now, our bonus episode on the Iliad has just been released, where we explore the story within, the themes used throughout, and even turn to some questions around historicity. To follow this up, we will then take his second great epic, The Odyssey, and give it much the same treatment. If you have been enjoying Casting Through Ancient Greece and have been wanting to support the series, please consider heading over to Patreon and checking out what's happening over there. To say thank you to everyone supporting the series there, I have been releasing monthly bonus episodes that have allowed me to go back over many aspects that we have covered in the series previously, to provide some more depth in certain areas. Members on Patreon also enjoy such features as ad-free, early release series episodes, monthly video series updates, reference transcriptions of the episodes, and a personal forum where you can ask me questions that will be answered monthly via video. If this interests you, please consider heading over to the Casting Through Ancient Greece Patreon page. Otherwise, you can also find other ways to support the series over at castingthroughancientgreece.com by clicking on the Support the Series button. Some through financial support, others just through a little of your time. Thank you for listening and following along with the series. I am very appreciative of the support that the show has been receiving. I look forward to hopefully engaging with you over on Patreon. Xerxes had launched his second invasion of Greece ten years after his father Darius had ordered his invasion of 490 BC. It would be now just over ten years since the second invasion of Xerxes, where it appears preparations were being made to launch yet another offensive against the Greeks. We had seen the lull between Darius and then Xerxes' campaigns had been occupied with matters elsewhere in the Empire before attention would be focused west once again. As we have just seen, it appears that a similar scenario was taking place after 479 BC. The Persian forces in the west would take some reorganising in the wake of Mikale and the cities of Ionia, shaking Persian control for a second time. There are indications that Artaphernes may have been launching incursions into Ionia to attempt seeing the revolt spread any further and perhaps even gain back some control. Though it appears he was in no position to launch a full-scale operation to take back complete control. The disorganisation in the West would go some way into explaining this, but other campaigns and potential revolts may have been other reasons the resources were not available to regain control in the West quickly. Though, added to this need to regain control along the Anatolian coast of this new offensive league that had been roaming the Aegean with impunity, the Delian League's activities that we know of had severely reduced Persian influence into Thrace. If it was left unchecked, it could potentially erode away at other areas on the edges of the empire. 
It should come as no surprise that the details around the build-up of the Battle of the Eurymedon are hazy. But this view that the Persians were looking to answer the threat of the Delian League and looking to mount an offensive has become the most accepted view. This supported by the vast level of resources the Persians had mustered in a concentrated location. The date of the Battle of the Eurymedon is far from certain, but based off of other known events taking place, either before it or after it, it would appear to take place somewhere from 469 to 466 BC. By this stage, the Persians had assembled a sizable fleet off the southern Anatolian coast, at the mouth of the Eurymedon River. Thucydides tells us it would be made up of 200 Phoenician triremes. Other later writers would also cite numbers ranging from 340 to 350. But Thucydides is often seen as the most reliable source to turn to, though it is worth pointing out some stock is given to Plutarch's account suggesting this force of 200 triremes was also awaiting further reinforcement by 80 more Phoenician ships coming from Cyprus. Through Plutarch we hear according to Ephorus that the Persian naval force was commanded by Tithrases. Though also present was a land army that would be commanded by Fernadates, while it appears there was also an overall commander, Aramandes. We are unsure of the size of the land force, but if it can be assumed the Persian force was going to set out to challenge the Delian League's presence, then a force of around 5,000 is estimated based on the number of ships that they could travel on. Remembering here the vast majority of men on the triremes were rowers. So back to the Delian League now that we have somewhat caught up on events over in the Persian Empire. We had left the League after seeing Thucydides' summary highlighting the development of it to where members were beginning to question their membership. This represented through the campaigns against Naxos. In the wake of forcing Naxos back into the League, we get indications from other sources, such as Plutarch, that the burden of providing men for the campaigning season was becoming unpopular. On the more extreme end, refusing to send ships or money would appear to be met with some sort of force, compelling the members to regain their commitment. Though what appears to have been happening was that the members who were opposed to sending their men had experienced enthusiasm within their cities for these campaigns waning. Their cities would have had to force large percentages of their male population into military service. This would have become unpopular and potentially caused political troubles at home. We see through Plutarch that many of these smaller to mid-sized member city states could have approached Athens and arranged to still stay members but were looking to free up their citizens. This then saw an arrangement where they would either provide their ships for service, though they would be crewed by Athenians, or they arranged to instead provide money. This then saw the Delian League becoming more Athenian than when it was first founded. This may also go some way into the description Thucydides gave of the growth of Athenian power, in the quote we ended with last episode. This would see the Athenians gain more military resources and experience, to where the other League members were no match in material and skill, since Athenian monopoly on both were continuing to increase. If this was the reality of the situation by this stage, the decision on campaigning and their ability to muster forces were likely becoming more streamlined. They would be able to respond much quicker to developments throughout the Aegean. The concentration of Persian forces appears to be one of the developments, and the first time since the early to mid 470s that the Persians posed a threat in the Aegean to the Greeks. It appears Chiron was able to respond to this growing threat before the Persians were able to launch any sort of offensive. Word would then have probably made its way back to the Athenians that a growing Persian presence was developing in southern Anatolia of men and ships. The Delian League influence exerted into the region not far away, so these movements would have most likely been observed and reported by those concerned, who would encounter this force initially if it set sail. This build-up was most likely taking place during the winter months to prepare for the coming campaigning season. Chiron, having then learnt of these developments, would have also spent the winter preparing for the coming campaign season. It would seem the Persians were mustering a force that was made up of a number of nationalities, like with most of its forces of the past. They were not known for their seamanship and were reliant on their subjected peoples with a maritime tradition. This would have seen the organisation and mustering of forces taking some time to come together. Though if Athens had the vast majority of the Delian League's resources, they would have been able to respond quicker to this growing threat, therefore putting the Persians on the back foot. Before setting out, Chiron would alter the triremes so that they would be able to carry more troops than previously. It would seem the design and the functions of the trireme from the initial shipbuilding programs initiated by Themistocles had not changed much over the years afterwards. But now, with news of the Persian army amassing, Chiron wanted to ensure he would have enough land forces to challenge them. 
With it seeming, he was also looking to a different tactic in naval combat. According to Plutarch, the triremes, which had been originally built with particular care by Themistocles for speed and rapid evolutions, and to which he, Chiron, now gave greater width and roomier decks along the sides to move to and fro, so as to allow a greater number of fully armed soldiers to take part in the engagements and fight from them. Chiron had then set sail with the Delian League fleet, where they arrived at the Anatolian coast at Sindos, situated on a headland before rounding the southern coastline. We are told here by Thucydides and Plutarch that the League's fleet was 200 ships strong, while Diodorus puts it at 250. The fleets then began following the coastline, where they approached the harbour town of Phasilis, which was inhabited by the Greeks, but still sympathetic to the Persians. The town denied entry to the Greek ships, so Chiron landed his men around the town and began laying waste to the countryside. It then appears that the town surrendered and joined with the Dillian League, before more bloodshed could take place. Supposedly the soldiers of Chios, who were in the League, were friends of the harbour town, and through them talks were arranged to where they learnt of the Greek offensive against the Persians, this perhaps them seeing their opportunity to become free Persian influence. It might also have been at this point where Chiron learnt of the 80 Phoenician vessels that were on their way from Cyprus to reinforce the Persian main fleet, which Plutarch tells us about. Phasilus was quite close to the Persian build-up, and being a harbour town, it probably had some role in supporting this build-up of troops and ships. So perhaps with this news, Chiron was now looking to make his way further around the southern coast as quickly as possible, to where the Eurymedon River flows into the sea, and where the Persian forces were building up to launch a new campaign from. His thinking here being that hopefully he could arrive and fight a battle on better odds before the extra numbers arrived. All of our sources give the impression that the Persians had received news of the Greek fleet nearby, and it likely they were looking to buy some time to allow their reinforcements to arrive. One source, Plutarch says, he lay waiting with the whole fleet at the mouth of the Eurymedon, with no design to fight, but expecting a reinforcement of 80 Phoenician ships on their way from Cyprus. As a fleet of the Delian League came into sight of the Persians, they were able to see that the Persians had deployed themselves in what seems to be a show of force, this in an attempt to make the Greek force put ashore somewhere to plan their next moves, this hopefully allowing enough time for the extra ships to make it to their location before a battle would be fought. Though Chiron fully aware of the reinforcements on their way, and are most likely gone into this approach on the Persian position with the intention of a fight, with all the other contingent commanders being briefed before setting out. This would now see the initiative lay with the Greeks, as the Persians didn't seem to have any sort of battle plan, other than attempting to deter the Greeks from attacking. As the Greek forces came on, it quickly became apparent to the Persian ships that they had failed in this attempt. Not having any other orders, they began to fall back into the mouth of the Eurymedon River, to prevent being attacked. What happened next is a little hard to determine from the sources, but it seems likely the commanders had recognised their folly of this move and quickly tried to get the withdrawing ships back out into the sea. Most of our sources suggest the Persians were either on par or slightly superior to the Greeks in terms of numbers. Falling back into the mouth of the river would see the ships of theirs picked off as the larger number of Greek ships could focus their attention on the smaller number of concentrated Persian ships as they retreated, funneling into the river. Not only this, but the Greeks would be able to keep the Persians bottled up in the river, and if they attempted to deploy, only a small number of ships could engage the Greeks at one time. Though, by all accounts, it appears that this attempted redeployment was a complete disaster. The Greeks kept coming on at the Persians with a predetermined plan of attack. The Persians were redeploying with no real direction of how to fight the coming battle. It is very likely that by the time the Greeks were on the Persian line, confusion was still throughout the ranks. It would seem the Persian navy was once again caught off guard, navigating a choke point while under attack, like what we saw at Salamis. It appears after first contact, the surviving ships turned and made their way to the shore, where the crews abandoned their ships and fled to where the land army was deployed. We are told that a great number of Persian ships were sunk or captured without much opposition. Plutarch says, They did nothing worthy of such mighty forces. Chiron now had another decision to make. He had defeated the Persian navy with relative ease, but he could see the Persian land forces as they marched towards the seaside. He now contemplated forcing a landing to engage the Persians on land. Even though he'd won a fairly easy victory at sea, the strain on the individual men was extremely taxing. They would have been fatigued from the battle and would be having to go up against fresh troops. Though Chiron would capitalise on the adrenaline 
that the men had running through their veins after their victory and ordered the Greek ships to the shoreline. As the Greek ships came ashore, the fighting men began to pour from the decks of the fighting platforms of their ships. It would seem the Persians stood their ground in formation, which would allow the Greeks to arrange themselves in large enough numbers to advance onto their position, at a run which we are told. The Persian land forces would prove to be a much tougher opponent than the navy. As the Greeks crashed into the Persian line, it held firm and the Persians put up a tough fight. A number of Athenians would fall in this clash on the shoreline, with some from the senior ranks and some with great reputations in courage. But eventually breakthroughs were occurring at points in the Persian line which would undermine the rest of the formation. This would see the line fall apart with Persians fleeing, being captured or killed in the route that took place. The victory was so complete that the Greeks were able to take the Persian camp and plunder the riches found within. Cimon had now won a victory at sea and then on land on the same day. This would rival the victories during Xerxes' invasion over ten years earlier, though he wasn't finished yet. While in the Persian camp, arranging the prisoners and booty in the wake of the victories, news arrived that the Phoenician reinforcements had been sighted. I also want to point out here that Diodorus gives us an alternative account of how the land battle occurred, though most scholars tend to agree that he's not our most reliable source around these matters. He tells us that Chiron had arranged for a number of captured Persian ships to be manned by the Greeks and they should be dressed in a similar manner to their previous crews. Having done this, they then landed ashore unopposed as night fell, with the Persians thinking them to be their own vessels and men. They were supposedly welcomed and then the Greeks fell on their camp having fully deceived them. Diodorus then tells us that the Persians apparently completely unaware of the Greeks having a land army, thought they were being attacked from peoples from inland and therefore manned some ships and sailed off into the night. Though like I said, this account isn't given too much weight. Also if you look at a map where the battle took place, it is hard to believe that the Persian land forces wouldn't have been aware of what was taking place out in the sea, since it was a large bay with no islands blocking any views. Anyway, let's get back to where Chiron had been made aware of the approach of the Phoenician reinforcements. Chiron's men at this stage would have been exhausted having fought a sea battle and now a land one. He had contemplated if forcing a land battle was a good idea and had taken advantage of the army's high after the victory. Now though, they would have come down. Even after their victory on land, exhaustion would have set in. But a great opportunity had presented itself. Chiron could eliminate the entire fleet and army that Xerxes had been assembling to direct against the Greeks in just one day. The risk was well worth it, plus the Greeks had the element of surprise and best to take advantage of it while it still existed. At once the crews and fighting men were ordered back out into their triremes to set sail to engage the reinforcing fleet. We have no idea of the number of Greek ships that were sent back out onto the sea for this second naval battle, though one would think it would not be the full complement that they had arrived with. Men were needed to secure the Persian camp and prisoners, while some of the ships would have sustained some sort of damage during the first battle and perhaps some being lost. Nevertheless, a sizeable Greek force set off to intercept the Phoenician reinforcements. The Phoenicians had no idea of what had been unfolding around the Eurymedon River earlier that day and were sailing with the intention of meeting up with a friendly force. Though as they approached the Anatolian coast, they would see the horizon beginning to fill with a navy at sea. Perhaps this may not have been too concerning to begin with, but as they came nearer it started to become more obvious this force was heading straight for them. With no intention of having to fight a battle at this stage, panic would have begun to set in with many of the crews. The commanders would have not briefed their fleets of any sort of battle plan, which would have only made the situation worse. Before long, the Greek force was on them and the carnage began. There are no details of this battle, but it's the outcome predictable. The Greeks, although tired from their previous two battles, held all the cards. They had the element of surprise. The Phoenicians thinking, they were just transiting to the Anatolian coast had not prepared tactically or mentally for any sort of engagement. Plutarch tells us that the Phoenicians lost all their vessels and most of their men that crewed them. As for the Greeks, we are unsure of any losses, but one would think they would have sustained extremely light casualties given the circumstances. Now I think it's worth pointing out here that this second naval battle only occurs in Plutarch's work, though how much we should read into Thucydides' account when trying to judge the credibility of this action is tough to say, since Thucydides does not elaborate on the details beyond telling us the Athenians and their allies won actions by land and by sea on the same day. This neither confirms nor denies the possibility of this second naval action. Whatever the true details were that took place on this day at the Eurymedon River, 
all our sources agree that the Delian League, in a single day, had destroyed the entire land and naval force that had been amassing. So, as I have said, this was the first major engagement against Persian forces since the end of the Second Persian Invasion. Like those large-scale clashes at Salamis, Plataea and Makale, the Eurydon River had turned out to be yet another disaster for the Persian forces. So what was the fallout from this victory? Well, this is a question that we don't really know the answer to. Again, this comes down to the relatively brief accounts of this period in trying to work out what event fits where. Plutarch does say that Xerxes had agreed to a humiliating peace in the wake of the defeat, though he also relates that this was doubted even in his times. This existence of a peace treaty is also doubted in our times, with no real evidence to go off of. It may be confused with a later peace that is reported to have taken place some 15 years later, supposedly officially ending the Greek and Persian War, though we will explore this in more detail down the track. Perhaps this victory may have also given the impression that a treaty had been agreed to, as Persian activities in the region were dramatically decreased because of what had taken place. Questions have also been raised as to why the Greeks had not followed up their victory in the region. It would have seemed that the only meaningful Persian force had been defeated, and they could exploit deeper into Persian territory. If this was even an objective of the League at this stage, we are not sure. They were not really equipped to conquer land far from their home regions and hold it. Additionally, it has been proposed that if the later date of the campaign, 466, was correct, then this would put it just before some other events that would take place in the Aegean that would require the League's immediate attention, and taking them away from southern Anatolia. These events we will get back to when we pick up the narrative of the operations of the Delian League. Though there would be further campaigning in and around the Aegean by the Delian League in the following years, what this battle did was put an end for the foreseeable future to any more active attempts at launching a campaign directed at Greece. It is also thought that with the destruction of the Persian forces in this region, the pressure on the Greeks of Western Anatolia was abated for the time being. Further to this, although we don't hear about the League's activities directly after the campaign, it seems likely they would have included more members into the League from the region of Caria, which bordered the region they were campaigning in. Next in the narrative, we are going to head back to look at the past 10 years or so in terms of political developments in Greece. We will look at the policies that were developing, the political interactions between the polis, and the events around some of the leading political figures. Then having done this, I think this will put us in a good position to continue forward with the developments of the Delian League and the Aegean, as this will become more intertwined with the policies and events heading forward. Though I do have a couple of interviews planned that will most likely follow this episode, but we will get back on track with the narrative after these. Thank you everyone for your continued support and a big shout out to all those who have found some value in the series and have been supporting it on Patreon and other various ways. Your contribution has truly helped me grow the series. If you've also found some value in the show and wish to support the series, you can head to www.castingsforancientgreece.com and click on the support the series button, where you can discover many ways to extend your support to helping the series grow. Be sure to stay connected and updated on what's happening in the series and join me over on Facebook or Instagram at Castings for Ancient Greece or on Twitter at Casting Greece. And be sure to subscribe to the series over at the Castings for Ancient Greece website. I hope you look forward to the coming interview episodes before we get back on track with episode 55, Evolving Policies. <laughs>